Okay. No, we don't. Welcome to the first episode of uh, of us. Wait, doing we a didn't podcast. figure out a name. We didn't figure we didn't out a name. There, a name. There, 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 we don't have a name. Pending. Episode one, no name. And no name yet. Epic failure. Yeah, Epic as failure. as per usual, and we'll figure it out. <laughs> so uh, I guess uh, to start things off. Uh, I am your host, Eric, and with me I have my two co-hosts, Anthony and Nat. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Greetings. Oh, no. Hello. Salutations. Hello. And uh, I, I guess to give. Uh, He's already drinking it. Oh, he's terrible. I didn't even Ugh. tell the people. What I'm the sorry. podcast is like? It, they don't even know Go yet. You know what? Actually, that's my party bad. Now. I know. My bad. I'll put, already I'll knows put a cap on myself, and uh, you go ahead and introduce the full breadth of this podcast. Yes. So uh, we are friends who uh, love to partake in spirits while also being avid gamer and game enthusiast. And so, as is our culmination of hobbies. We wanted to create a podcast where we try out different beers, whiskeys, spirits, and the like, while covering some of the uh, up-to-date gaming news as it goes forward. And so I guess to start things out, every episode we're going to cover a new spirit, and this, to, to start us off, uh, is a wonderful IPA by New Belgium, and it is the Voodoo Ranger Juicy Haze IPA. Absolutely. And Nats is gigantic. Yeah, Nats. Mine is massive. So sorry, guys. How many ounces is that? Is that 24? That is, I believe, 24. Let me look. That nice. is 3.2 fluid ounces. That's a full pint. Well, yeah. And while Anthony and I proceed to enjoy the next hour and a half to two hours with y'all, um, Nat will proceed to get drunk during those yeah, two absolutely. hours. Absolutely. And absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I can join Nat. <laughs> I think we'll be okay. I think we'll be okay. I am. I... Are we? Are we drinking this now? Or am I waiting? Yeah. I think yeah. I we think we can go ahead and break into this and just get some general taste uh, notes. All right. I must 100. say though, figure out how this tastes. Yeah. I tasted one of their other ones in my variety pack. And it was disgusting for me because apparently, so I have terrible taste buds. And the, and let me tell you a little bit uh, about this beer and, and kind of why it's our uh, our, our first one. So it, it, this is an IPA. IPAs tend to be very hoppy. They tend to be a little bit bitter. Um, and I typically hate IPAs. And my uh, stepfather tends to hate IPAs and he had this IPA and said it might very well be the 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 only IPA he likes. So I have it a good authority that this is a okay. very IPA for a non IPA drinker. Now okay. they're usually pretty low in IPA. They're usually very carbonated. Um this one is a juicy haze IPA. And so it should be sweeter. It should be a little bit sweeter. I have been told you should get some like citrusy, floral, almost pineapple-y flavors in it. Um while also being very crisp, a very summer type of ale. Yeah, you can and, definitely smell the pineapple. Yeah. Hmm. I yeah, I get a lot of pineapple on the, the head at least. And it's also a hazy IPA. And essentially, that's just referring to it, it's cloudy, a little bit cloudy. Mm. And yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this, and we're gonna we're gonna see how it goes. Oh, he's got a glass. He put it in a glass. Oh, All my glasses are in so, to step up. So, funnily enough, for the people who can't see, I actually uh, I'm the only one who went all out for the podcast of course i actually have <laughs> the new belgium uh glass which by the okay, way is I have the company that glass too that but i'm moving Look, man. anthony is moving and i also already finished quite a bit of this before we started oh, so oh my god <laughs> yeah like like we said earlier nat went hard from the get-go now i will say 
I actually like this IPA quite a bit. Uh, it is very, very smooth. Um, there isn't a lot of hoppy flavor. It's very citrus forward. Yeah. It's very just refreshing, easy drinking. I would definitely recommend this to anybody who wants to have something that's kind of an easy summer drink. that's a little bit fruitier mm-hmm. and doesn't have a lot of hop flavor to it. Um, Anthony, Man. your thoughts? Because it seems like just from the look that this is this is not up your alley. <laughs> so, like on the first sip, I was like, "Hey, maybe this is gonna work out," because you know it was a little bitter and didn't taste good, but it wasn't as powerful and bad tasting as most. But now it's kind of like a good hot sauce. And it just keeps getting more bitter and more disgusting. Wow. The cool, and the and more that it is gets, the more the unfortunate the, the British the uh British, oh my god, the British aspect of the uh the beer comes out. No, the bitter part of this beer sits at the back and then as it gets warmer it gets more and more pronounced. I've I don't know if I told you guys about this, I don't know, but uh I spent pretty much an entire weekend in Asheville drinking nothing but hazy ipas that's where i'm moving i was about to say right Asheville they is in, the place for beer for sure they invent they pretty much uh have a cornerstone of microbreweries in there and food's pretty good uh mm-hmm. the beer will destroy you <laughs> and uh, just just for reference uh to kind of give a little bit more history about this beer it is by the new belgian brewing company uh mm-hmm. and for reference that is in Asheville. So this is oh, a straight okay. out of Asheville uh, brewery, and this is a hazy uh, IPA that's very citrus forward. Um, and and just for reference, a lot of these hazy IPAs that are very citrus forward, they're actually very quick brews. Um, they sometimes take less than a week from uh, like spoiling the wort to actually getting to a glass. So, like, time of starting to brew to getting to glass can oftentimes be very short with the hazy eye. Got you. Um, My notes for this, I would say, there are juicier IPAs. I'll say that. This is still good. And um, for my taste, I would say that this is at least, like, a crushable um uh, beer definitely like definitely palatable compared to people who are like out there drinking very much more stringent ipas like if you're out if you're trying to drink a standard ipa from i don't know um got any brewery really from houston uh, you're gonna probably get hit in the face with something real bitter yeah. um this is nice um there it, in the interest of Anthony's notes, there are juicier beers that we could probably feed to you that would like get you closer to like to seeing the, the benefit of IPAs. Because I don't hate IPAs. I, I don't hate beers. I but... I typically love beer. And, and just to give the audience some kind of background, I am very much a stout dark beer person. I don't do a Oof. lot of IPAs. And why now that's like literally the kind of the same flavor pattern because like with a lot with a lot of stouts you get yes you get that milk stout you get that like heady like um uh lactin a- aspect of it where it's 100%. kind of thick and you're sucking it down pretty much like a baby but um <laughs> and and that's but, half the fun right like it's half the fun man that's right the reason why like one of them is called like dragon milk or something like that but you I also have to kind like of like off, you have to offset that with either you're gonna go for the full holiday spice and do like the cinnamon and the nutmeg and really get more heady, or you're gonna go for the spice and then you're hitting the same thing that IPAs do, which is really like kind of like hitting you with a kind of like a thick pour, but also hitting you with a lot of like astringent kind of uh, taste. Uh, what would it be? what would that be? Genres or whatever. I I a hundred percent see. <laughs> Uh, what you're getting at. I, I think the biggest thing for me is that I love a beer that balances out the bitterness mm-hmm. of the hops mm-hmm. 
more than the hops are coming out. Like, I want that sweeter, the lacto... Like, I love milk stouts. I love it when you add uh, the lactose and the, the, uh, gets that lactose, full that's what breath it is. Thank you. of, okay. like, breadiness and those darker flavors that almost get, like, baking spices... Yeah, it's like eating a, it's like eating a dessert. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's eating a dessert wonderful. whenever you have it. It's absolutely there wonderful. Is, there is a actually now that I think about it, I have a. Let me see if I can. No, I won't find it now. I used to be really big into buying like bottles of stouts off of this app uh, on my phone. I don't even remember what the, what it's called anymore. But uh, they used to deliver like just like boxes of beer to my house because literally I would just spend my time off looking at the current releases of microbreweries that they had and be like, oh, that looks good. I'll go ahead and take two bottles of it. So, like, a box of 20 beers would show up at my house, like, at the beginning of the month or whatever. But uh, there was a stout that I bought that is literally like black tar heroin. Oh, man. <laughs> it, it's fantastic, but at the same time, I don't you know if fantastic is the right word. Look, <laughs> maybe it's not the best analogy, but you get what I'm saying. It's really good, but at the same time, you can only have so much of it. Like, there's no way that you're filling up a glass, like, as tall as this uh, beer can with that kind of like, that kind of content. And that's why I'm like, okay, if you're looking for something crushable, if you're looking for something that, like, you can get to the end of it and have, like, a satisfaction of, like, that was a good beer, I've had my meal, I'm done. I would probably stay away from stouts just because the the deeper you go into that tunnel of like, let me find the flavor palette that f that fits me, the harder it becomes to find something that's going to be uh, not so much. Uh, they can make it. It's just it's hard to put it into a small enough can and be packaged and shipped off to you. Like the, thing, the closest that I've gotten is Black is Beautiful. I don't remember the brewery, but it's it's somewhere locally in Houston, in uh, Texas, I believe. And that is the by far the best. Uh, Black is Beautiful. Black is Beautiful. It's like the best stout I've ever. Had. I think it's a stout. I could be wrong. It might be brown something. I know it's a brown. Uh, it might be a brown ale, but it's fantastic. Yeah, uh, it's a it's a, uh, they just released a volume two of Black is Beautiful. Oh. It's an IPA recipe. Um, no, it's not. Yeah, it's an IPA, IPA recipe. They uh, betrayed me. <laughs> done by the National Black Brewers Association, working yeah. with them. Um, I have a friend who works there. Man, that's he was like, dude, you got to get this. That's really cool. I'd love to try that one. It could be yeah, on the list. Yeah. We'll go ahead and add it to the list then. Yeah, but it, it, sure. they, there, there's beers out there that like are are much more palatable to what I think you're going for. It's just not so much something here. Like what I would say, I would ask, what were the elements that immediately said this was a no go for you? So I think I'm just unlucky in the genetic lottery of what taste buds I have that freak out when I taste this, and they're like, "This is poison. This is disgusting. <laughs> Don't drink this." Because I literally the visceral only reaction. Taste <laughs> yeah, so you're and you're only getting a lot of the hops, which is interesting because I feel 100%. like this is only... the only thing. Yeah, I think you. I think he needs something that is comp that is so uh, and nuanced in other flavor palettes that he doesn't even oh. catch the the the, uh, the alcohol aspect at the very end. Agreed. Much like whiskey. I, I even I was trying to like numb my taste buds with the bourbon i have or the rye i have and this doesn't work yeah maybe it next is... time i'll try to have some like beer nuts to see if that helps because supposedly that yeah, something help. to cut through the doesn't... hoppiness yeah that'd be uh, that's for sure yeah i would love a suggestion of some beer nuts i love beer nuts oh, or so, well, what, what was the uh whiskey nuts that we had while we oh by the way we also uh recently came back from uh eric's like a bachelor party and yeah, or that's right. wedding. That's right. Both combined. Uh, Both and we combined. had plenty of good uh, whiskey during that. We are kind of 
whiskey aficionados masquerading as uh, <laughs> beer advocates at the moment, at least for this episode. However, for we plan, now, yes, we definitely plan to do some whiskeys in the future. That is definitely more of our forte. Um, yeah, I think that Flaviar thing could be really cool. Yeah, yeah uh, definitely, Fla- definitely. Flaviar, please uh, feel free to sponsor. I actually, yeah, I got that for my dad, my dad for his birthday. So I'm looking. Ooh, oh, that's an awesome gift. It. Awesome gift. Super dope. Super yeah. dope. Now, All I right. will say, just as a last note on this, uh, the Voodoo Ranger before uh, we kick it off the range, is I, I don't think there's many beers on the market that have such good brand recognition when you're walking oh, down no. the aisle. Absolutely not. Right? Yeah. Like, I, I, I have to say, regardless of whether you end up liking this beer or not, I think it's on the more palatable end of IPAs, at least for me personally. Um, man, they really nailed the marketing. Uh, yeah. The, New Belgium, the props to that. Beautiful. The and general I, vibe. I wanted yeah. to speak on that and just kind of give a shout out because the, um, the art, I, I, I actually pulled it up. And it, it, it had quite the interesting story, but the label design is actually done by a woman named Ann Fitch, who is a watercolorist. Uh, and she's apparently been working for New Belgium for 19 years. Now. Jesus. And uh, she's got stock in the company. And I don't know if that is this beer label or not. Unfortunately, it's kind of difficult to figure out who exactly um, did the skeleton artwork. But I do know that she did the the logo that's on the glass that I showed, the bike logo here. Mm-hmm. And whether she did the 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 marketing for this particular beer or, or not, they're definitely doing a great job with the marketing. Definitely. So props to them I, for that. Yeah. Kudos, uh, New Belgium. You're doing great. Yep. So I, I guess we'll move on to the, the kind of like second big section. Uh, what mm-hmm. has everybody been playing this week? What are the, the games that we have been enjoying? I mean, who wants to start? Because I have a feeling it's all going to be the same game. I feel I, like we're all no, on the record, maybe. I, I have an interesting one that I'll, I'll throw my hat in for. But I, let's okay. go ahead and start with uh, Anthony. I feel like he's been moving, and he either will have the shortest or the longest list. <laughs> okay. So, lately, a little bit of Magic the Gathering, thanks to the Lord of the Rings thing. Oh, Both wow. in person nice. and on Magic the Gathering Arena. In it's person. been great. The Hobbit and the dwarves and the elves and the wizards and orcs are just incredible. So a little bit of that. Um, on top of that, oh man, I think there was a fourth game and now I just completely lost it. Uh, I actually just tried getting over it again, but on the iPad. <sighs> Um, that was no. a terrible experience and hurt my fingers no. really quickly. I can, I can imagine. Wait, again, it, it, like walk me through that because I've never, I've only ever played the computer version. How is the interaction on the iPad? Like, what do you, what is the physics? Like, do you just move your finger in circles? Wherever you put your finger, wherever you, yeah, you just move your finger in circles anywhere on the screen. And I hate it. It, <laughs> it sounds really painful. Terrible. Thanks. I got I up to the it. part where you have the column with the two lights. And at that part, I was just like, I don't think I can, I don't think I can get through this. I remember there was a trick, but like, there's just no control with maybe the finger. This is, maybe this is just me, and I'll, 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 I'll make this short because I, I, I know you might have more games to go ahead and list. Maybe it's just me. I cannot stand games that are out there to actually make me just rage, like literally just rage, like. There is a there is from software games and like Dark Souls and like yeah high difficulty I get that but do not put me in a game where the narration follows the failures that I actually execute and then as it goes like I can't I'm sorry so I, I can't I, I mean I I I hate to say it but I I think you're in the minority here like I if know. we just look at <laughs> only up which is of course the phenomenon of the past 
what two months and the of, amount of, of players those kind of games yeah yeah the Fadian games have just shot up every single one that comes out ends up doing so well and i think that has a lot to do with like streamer culture and the fact that mm, like true. people don't really like playing those games but they love to enjoy the experiences of oh, failure yeah. together right oh, yeah. and that's interesting content and that causes sure people to play it. that's something right and yeah it has to be and overcoming that is like a, a gotcha for friends you know like being able to go oh yeah i got i did only of last night i beat it yeah, you know? yeah. And, and like i am sure that is i mean that seems to just sell so well mm. and it's like jump night yeah jump king jump king jump king i knew it was like some oh my god jump king take me out the podcast yeah. guys <laughs> <laughs> we're taking I've your gamer card the... away yeah, oh my god done. jump night oh jesus christ <laughs> holy moly guys <laughs> but yeah anyway, it, those uh, styles of yeah, games yeah. are they blow up every time they come out. It seems to just consistently do well, and it's a very low effort development. Uh, interestingly yeah. enough, as well. And yeah, for a... me, it's like, for me, it's like, yeah, I like playing it to an extent, but I don't really care if I beat it. Oh, at one point, I'm just, just like, you're just in for the whatever, pain. Done. Yeah, it's just like, oh, that was fun, and. uh yeah, moving on. I, I, not intentionally. I just like, you know, stop playing once and then never play again. Yeah, I think okay. I fall into the camp of there. I have played a bunch of them. Like I went through and I beat getting over it. I, I beat uh, Jump King, at least the first one. I never did any of the expansions. I beat Pogo Stock. But at the same time, Jesus, man. But at the same time, you I love those games. I don't Eric, love them. I don't There's care. no love. It's, no, it's it is. not a love thing. It's just. Then what is it? There. I like getting into that Zen mode and just having something where where you accomplish a goal. And relatively speaking, they don't take as long as some other games that are played. And I feel like I can put on a book or a podcast or a show or a YouTube series and I can just go into Zen watching or listening to a show or listening to a book and just play the game for like eight hours and just like, you know, it's like a fidget toy, I think. Okay. And but so I have a question for you. Okay. At what point in time, whenever you are playing that game, does the Zen make up for the fact that you are currently an hour into the game? Like, whatever time that you've put into the game, at what point does the Zen lock in and actually make the playing of it, like, count? Because I understand, like, locking into a zone. Like, there are, there have been multiple modes in my, in my video game career that I've been, like, I've felt myself sinking into the, the dark place or whatever. The and dark like, place. Oh, okay. Yeah. When I'm just like, okay, I'm going to be able to, I'm like, no matter what happens, I have this boss fight, but I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to come out. <laughs> it's so, like, I'm in it. I'm in yeah. It now. Like, like, I'm going to be playing until like three o'clock in the morning and then look up and be like, what happened to me? Yeah. Uh, but for those kind of games, I, I, I never feel that kind of like, intuitive feeling that I, w I want to reach that zen moment just because the game wants to punish me all the way up until then and then only whenever i reach the, like the full focus of a of like a in the zone moment does the game actually unlock for I, for, I, for for me i think my brain just it, it like thinks about it differently like when i'm playing especially a fadian type game it's very much about the process and very little about the destination. Like, mm. I really think about it, and I'm just like, for getting over it, for example. It's a methodical, circular move it, movement. And I mm. just get into just moving my mouse like that while listening to a podcast or watching a show. If I okay. mess up, I'm just back at the bottom. I'm doing the exact same thing as I was at the top. 
the the distance I am away from the end is not a part of my experience in general. And essentially what I consider it is the time to beat the game is the amount of time I have to listen to X thing that I'm listening to rather than thinking about it from a perspective of like, oh, I fell all the way from the top and now I'm back in the bottom. That's just more time for me to listen to X thing. Anthony, listen to me when I say this. Eric literally just said, no, it's not the destination. It's the journey. A <laughs> journey before yep. destination. It's journey before destination. And I'm like, get your Brandon Sanderson bullshit. Dude, a hundred percent out of my video games. A hundred percent. I I am Kaladin Ooh. after the mental breakdowns. Like we're good. Even after, you know what? That's a different podcast. <laughs> that's a different podcast. <laughs> let's not talk about oh, that. Oh, that poor man. Yes, okay, poor man. Anyway, okay. so Anthony, anyway, you play, so dude? other games. Uh, I've been playing Trackmania. I've been really enjoying the new summer Track season. They changed it up a little bit. What challenge? Trackmania, Track Mania, like a racetrack. Track me. Track. Oh, you did show me that. I remember that. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. okay, okay. I, I really enjoy that game. It's nice and so. Funnily uh, enough, just to kind of insert on Track Mania, because for anybody who doesn't know, Anthony and I have gone on and on about our different opinions on racing games in general. However, I have played a good bit of Track Mania now with Von V, my uh, wife. Are you serious? Yeah, and she actually enjoys it so much and i definitely don't hate it enough not to play with her so we've done a bunch I'm of the days play with her this weekend yeah has she had any deja vu moments what do you Y'all mean by deja daily, vu daily hard man you know like initial you know, deja vu <laughs> has she sunk into the zone that's no. what i'm asking <laughs> no i don't <laughs> I, I, you know, it's, it's hard to say yet. I, I think she has a little bit, but not to the extent that we do. Okay. Got you. Did, did, did y'all start with the seasonal track? We did. We actually, I went okay. and did a seasonal and we did those go um, like easy to, to hard. Yeah. And we went through a Great bunch production. of those and then we've done some of the dailies after we did like a full season or something like that. So what's yeah. the premise of uh, track mania? I, I love that game. Like what like what do you uh, do? Track track mania is um basically on most of the tracks it's like set the fastest lap time, but also complete the track. I like to compare it to a game like Mario Maker because mm. seasonally mm. they release new tracks from the publisher or you know the game creators, but every day they have a cup of the day. And Cup of the Day is really cool because most people haven't played it. There's a chance that you've played it in the, like, part of the game where it's like, these tracks are under construction by players. Like the open, like the, uh, what is it mm-hmm. called? Uh, when the yeah. game is in beta or, or, like, open open release or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, ultimately, you might not have raced the track in its final state when you did try it. And so the coolest thing about track of the day is the app or cup of the day it happens three times a day, but the first time almost no one has experienced that track. So you are all together racing it, and based off of your like first fifteen minutes, you get a time, uh, you set your best time, and then you get put in a division to race against those players. And then Ooh. every round it knocks off like four players out of like the sixty four. Oh. Oh, and eventually shit. it knocks off two and one. And one of the great things about it is when you get knocked out, it's actually really fun just to spectate and watch the other players that finish your little tournament. That is such a great way to create a freaking community around yeah. like racing on a track. Like the ingenuity of saying no, like even if you ex- like exert your full expertise and it's not enough. You can mm-hmm. then also watch the top dogs literally do, like dogfight it out on this track. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I, I, so, yeah. The question there is 
what initially makes you feel as if you want to stay and watch? Because I'm going to be honest, when I think about my time playing Apex Legends, it's... I never wanted to continue to watch the freaking game. I never wanted to know what was actually going to happen at the end of the game because I, I was because... already immediately checked out. It's because, to me, Trackmania isn't just a racing game where, you know, you're doing the same lap over and over again, and it's relatively easy. In Trackmania, it's just like a, a speedrunning thing, where if while you're watching these other players, they're, you want to you want to see what tricks are they using, how fast mm -hmm. are they hitting that, what, well, how are they handling this corner differently than me and you just start picking up on ways to do better especially because for each track there's bronze silver gold and then beat the author's time and the author's Ooh. time is usually hard to to beat and you get rewards in the game for doing that and of course it just feels good when you're like yeah i beat the author um and you get to actually see your ranking for your locality for the world if you want to and you can just be like you, you can see how well you did a track like there's one track in the seasonal where i got the gold but then i was like i really like this track i think i can go a lot faster and i kept doing it and then i got the author time and it was just like this was great completely um, like experience but I, one thing i haven't described though is that on in track mania there are there, there's normal asphalt, there's dirt, there's uh, like magnetic that like holds you down. So like normally if you go over a hill, you get airborne. But on this magnetic r road, you go over a hill and you're glued to the ground. And it's weird, but you have to learn how to interact with it. There's ice and there's several other surfaces. Additionally, there's like boost or your... your uh, wheels will temporarily go into like hover mode while you're flying through the air mm -hmm. and trying to and it's not easy to control and you're trying to thread the needle somewhere so it's just really complex and nuanced and the, the, of course there's drifting and and sometimes like there was one track that i could not get enough of and took me forever to get a gold medal on last season and it was two lap and it's so interesting when someone does a double lap right Oh, and also, the most probably another important thing, they're very three dimensional. It's oh, not like so normal racing where it's 2D. You'll be going, and I mean, there's races where you start like this and you're falling straight down. And then in certain scenarios, the camera will like automatically go into like first person view because there's no other way that you'd be able to see anything because you just went up and upside down and through a loop and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then, on, and when like when you're on ice, you have to put the camera in like another mode like third person because when you are on ice you have to be completely sideways which means you can't see where you're going God. So, okay. but but yeah. if you change the camera the camera stays straight and, you know and exactly your car is okay, turned idea yeah so it's i love that game i've been playing it for a long time but i recently got back into it because it's now on playstation 5 it's also on steam so i got it on my steam deck so, do you prefer to play it on a controller enough. or on a keyboard? I prefer a controller, but I think most of the best players in the world actually use a keyboard. That Especially makes sense. because I think, I don't know if they changed it, but at one point in time with the keyboard, you could choose the angle of your tires. Really? Which can be very important for trying to like get that perfect turn. You know, instead of doing the analog stick and trying to be really good with moving that, you just push mm -hmm. a button and you know it's where I need it to be. Got but I'm, I'm not, I, I just, I like the feel, especially on the PlayStation 5, you get the haptic feedback. Oh, and the one just, game that uses haptic other than Deathloop, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that game's been great. Uh, of course, you know, Playing Diablo 4, I actually got Battle.net on my Steam Deck, so I could play that. Um, and I think everyone knows the game's pretty good. Uh, I think the only thing it's missing for me in the season right now is that there's not, like, a, an armor set that I'm, like, wanting to get. I'm like, I enjoy playing the game, but, like, 
why am I playing this season? I don't. Yeah. I, I, I'm like, I'm playing it to play with my friends mostly. Not, I'm like, I, what am I trying to earn here? I don't know. I don't see it. Aspects aren't very interesting to me. I will say that my game list is very short. Well, not so much short to yours compared to yours. I only have really two games. Well, sorry. No. I have three. Never mind. Okay. I have no, three I, games. Wait, short list. Wait. Okay. Oh. Okay. I have three games. I haven't, I haven't gotten to my, to my real game, though. Oh, he has a real game. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to skip Baldur's Gate 3 because y'all are going to oh. talk about that. Because okay. I'm basically just a uh, combat person that doesn't actually know how the game works. Oh, <laughs> Anthony. My game that I've been really into for the past week or two is Mecha Bellum. Mecha I saw Bellum. you playing this. I was I was I was waiting for this. It is I actually wanted to ask so you about great. it. Like I I Mecha I Bellum. have I have seen Mecha Bellum before. I have seen uh a, a little bit of Day 9 play it. And yes. I I wanted to get the rundown. Like w- w- yeah. I know the basics, but get full rundown. Like, what is this game? So, what is interesting heard, about it? I have heard this game, and I have watched Day it. Day 9. Down. It looks really fun. Yeah. yeah, Day 9 did get me into it. But what was interesting is I just came off of watching the latest season of GSL and having, like, a StarCraft two like, craving. And I, it, I wasn't getting satisfied by trying to watch, like, ESL or other things. And then I saw Day 9 playing Mechabellum, and that actually has the same type of feeling as watching a StarCraft match, which is fascinating because uh, it's an auto-battler. Yeah. But it's oh, specifically okay. an auto-battler inspired by real-time strategy games like StarCraft II. I, so I, somehow... I just love the, the top comments that are like, do you like RTS? Are you <laughs> an 80-year-old man who can't move his fingers? <laughs> Oh Play God. Mechabellum! <laughs> like, profit. <laughs> like, that's funny. Now, I will say, I know there's no technical micro, yeah. but at least when you're using a trackpad, that timer is pretty short, and there's a lot of stuff you got to do to manage it. So an old man would be I believe screwed. you're playing that on a freaking trackpad. That's I can't ridiculous. Believe. That's crazy. Yeah. Now, trackpad uh, and touchscreen. Touchscreen's been helping. Okay, I almost Bloody. see like in, in in the Steam pictures here, uh, just so we can see that. I see like mech build. It almost looks like you build mechs to some degree. Like, what's the customization I'm seeing it, here? It's really really cool. So at the beginning of the game, you pick two mechs that you're going to start the game with, and they're usually like small and or medium size, not the giant ones. And you have a specialization, and your specialization might be like all of your mechs get plus three to movement speed, or you get 50 more supply each round, or you start with a level three elite marksman who's like a sniper. And so you pick one of the four things, your opponent sees the same four options, and then you start the game and you have 200 supply. And so you position the mechs you've started with, and um, some of them, like the smaller ones, come in groups, like an army, like a 3 by 15 or something like that, like 45 units. Some of them are like one at a time. And so you, you put them where you want them. They're trying to protect your two towers because if your tower gets downed during the battle, all of your units get a major debuff, and they can just roll the rest of the game on you. Damn. And so in the beginning, you can spend those 200 resources on unlocking a mech and then bringing in those mechs. You can only bring in two at a time. Uh, by default, there are ways to bring in more. Um, but, you know, you, you deploy, you put them anywhere you want. There's things like shields and and the rockets, like bombs that you can put down. There's, like, auto-defense turrets that'll shoot down enemy, uh, basically, rockets, but they're rockets well, coming from... Should mechs there's so much variation and then at the end of each round you're presented with four choices and your opponent is presented with the exact same four so there's an element of like predicting what they're going to pick sometimes it's a nuke and it's like they're probably going to pick the nuke because they sometimes it's hard yeah yeah 
Sometimes it's like you get to now summon these anywhere on the map, and you summon them behind enemy lines. And oh, it's pretty great. You can actually always summon your own units behind enemy lines, but um, the, the first time they take works. a while to, to warp in. And a very interesting fact, you can only move units that you just summoned this round. So you are committing to where uh, they're going to start on every round. Um, but it's just, it's beautiful, and it, it's fun to watch the thing. It's very intense when you're trying to strategize and decide what to do here, and then you get to watch the chaos, but also you're trying to watch so many things because the camera's only so big, and there's sometimes battles occurring all over the place. And you're just trying to micromanage, like, okay, who's winning where? What can I do differently here? And if someone uses a nuke, you actually don't know if you would have won the, the fight in a, in a straight-up fight. So now you're going into the next round completely, like, mm. kind of blind. Got you. Oh, it's and, a good way to go ahead and yeah. kind of uh, mask any forms of adapta adaptation oh. that they might have been, do been done. And every mech levels up. But you have to pay for it to complete its level, which leveling up is always Ugh. important. They also have upgrades, and I think all of these upgrades apply to every mech of the same type. Um, so, so like, like you buy it once and of, you get it for all of them type of deal? Yeah, like if you have like five hackers, you want to get barrier. And they all walk around with a barrier, and those around them will be shielded. And by the way, hackers... If they are successful in hacking an enemy unit, it becomes your unit. Permanently? Which is so great for the rest oh. of that battle. Okay, for, for the rest of, of that round. Yeah. And and one of the real fun ones is there's uh there's upgrades that it's like this unit spawns this unit. Oh, and by the way, that unit spawns this unit. And so then you've got just like a bunch of units just like pooping out more and more units so just, and you have like a growing like, army. It sounds like for somebody who may have choice paralysis. This is probably a great option because it's literally like, hey, you make one choice and then like you're you're pretty much set. You only have A or B or C. Like Yeah. So I heard about this game about a month ago. Uh mm -hmm. YouTuber that I follow. And I was watching it and I was like, this seems really fun. It seems like something Anthony or Eric would play. <laughs> and I was like, hey, I mean, it seems me. right up my alley. It, it seems yeah. super cool. I have been wanting to play it. I just limited it amount of time. Dope. I've had some other choices on my list that I've been. Interested. Of course, of course. Now, I will say thing for me. Oh. Okay, go, go, go for it. The biggest thing for me is I've wanted to play StarCraft 2 for ages. I've been watching oh. it forever. I always want to play it, but I know how intense that game is yeah. and that I'm not going to do well at all. It's and this design. game is satisfying that StarCraft II desire. That's awesome. Without the, and it's without way the more approachable. Yeah. Without the crunch. Yeah. Yeah. Without oh, having absolutely. to practice and, micro every day. <laughs> and outside of the, uh, the game, you can go into like the garage and customize what each mech has as available upgrades. All you can only have four available yeah. in a game, but you can switch up like I don't want. I never. I never get that upgrade. I'm gonna get this upgrade instead. I'm gonna go for like this build. Oh, you can be like, hey, nice. like this is what this is what I usually run, mm -hmm. and it's either adaptable or it's not, and you just like you're pretty much set in. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, Anthony, it what is, is your what is your uh, game that you have your eyes on right now? Like you haven't played it, but like you're like, okay, I'm gonna probably look into this or play this later. Well, it's not out yet, but it's um. Oh man, what's the StarCraft two? game coming out basically Starcraft it's uh it's a it's an rts that's coming out that i hope is amazing oh man don't see, see if i can find it don't bait me and then not be able to tell me exactly what it is new rts game coming out it's i know like, now now it's like let's they... let's google the most arbitrary things and see if we can find oh it. my god <laughs> Uh, is it Stormgate? That's on Steam. Buddy. S Stormgate does look good. Uh, and, uh, no, it is. I think it it is Stormgate. I am. 
counting down the days that I don't think we know yet yeah, to when so Stormgate Storm comes out. Okay. It's hopeful. It's hopefully an actual real RTS that could be as good as StarCraft Two. Uh, well, okay. a lot of the a lot of the people who worked on StarCraft are are a part of Frost Giant Studios, right? Because I mean, like exactly, Blizzard yeah. staff pretty much fucking exnate out of that shit. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and you know what's nice about it? When you're watching that game, it's not all just got a blue filter on it like StarCraft Two. Oh, every yeah. time, every map in StarCraft Two looks blue. <laughs> True, uh, it's the filter. I mean, it is it is the color of the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Mecha Bellum, I highly recommend it. It's absolutely just great. Okay. Um, okay. I am. I. I have definitely like. I. I love StarCraft Two. I. I have definitely been looking for something to satisfy kind of the StarCraft Two itch for a while. So I'd be down mm -hmm. to buy it. Now, I will say, everybody. Just, just totally unrelated to the game itself, because everybody kind of knows the publisher is Paradox, but the developer Game River who does Mechabellum, I, I just feel free to go check their developer page. Mechabellum seems like a totally cool, normal style of game, uh, but it, is anybody else extremely interested to see what they're doing with Out of Hands? Because this game looks absolutely insane. Uh, oh yeah, it is a, a thriller game? card game, and the cards out of hands has like hands with eyeballs. Like I, I have no good way to explain <laughs> what this game is, except that it looks like poker nope. with with nope. <laughs> hands. awkward looking hands. There is a person that looks like they have no face. Their eye is this. Like that. It's a picture of hands like this, and those are the eyes. Oof. Just just putting that out there. Uh, okay. This is the same developer that does Mechabellum. Just put it. Just, just interesting. You know, you know, just like, you, you know, know just you know what? Very this is a situation. This is a situation where someone like like us got together, started a gaming company, all right. and we're all working on Mechabellum. <laughs> and then one day, we the people working for us, and so, and the devs are like. I got nothing to work on. I, I, I can't work on anything right now. And then Shit. one of us who's crazy enough says, let's make my game. <laughs> oh <laughs> my God. With the downtime. Yes, you, know, you know this is somebody's passion project. <laughs> like, I bet this game is going to be fantastic. There's no way it can't oh be. God. Because it, it's Nuts. so, just the pictures are so oh out of God. this world. Crazy. That yeah, it's yeah. either going to be amazing or off the wall bad shit crazy or crazy which will be amazing in and of itself like that that itself, alone will be enough uh Galladay. yeah i just i was looking through the developer to see what else they did and by the way like if you look through this video these cards are all animated so all of these weird no, hands are you. moving nope. around <laughs> on the card nope hate it <laughs> it's so creepy yeah i saw one picture and i oh, exited man. that I, mean, I cannot hate it absolutely crazy no not a fan no thank you <laughs> oh man <laughs> i will pass a body horror game so yeah matt your your three, three games <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah let's yeah. go with that yeah. okay so i will avoid the one that probably me and eric are sharing i don't know actually you know what i haven't seen eric playing this game so i don't know we'll see um so my first game that i was playing is diablo 4 uh quick note about that game i um I recently watched an interview from an ex Blizzard uh, uh, manager, and he kind of it 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 outlined how I should view the current Blizzard versus how I used to think about their games, and he outlined that like the expectation is always that Blizzard is going to continue to do it what Blizzard does. It's going to be an amazing game, and he says like that culture of creating a game that is for the players and their experience is dead. They are a puppet of Activision and therefore, and a lot of their actions are not going to be for you. It's going to be for farming nostalgia 
and continuing to make as much money as possible off of already established IPs. So I, I have kind of a counter to this because I, I think I have an interesting view on Diablo 4 while we're kind of on it and it's kind okay. of fresh here. Okay. Um, because uh, my, my wife is not a big game player. Okay. She hasn't played a lot of games in her life. Fair. She absolutely loves Diablo. She's never played the first three. She didn't mm -hmm. know what they were. She has no right. inkling of the story. And I think my own personal opinion and how Diablo 4 is kind of set up, and Blizzard in general has kind of been mm. set up in such a way that they are catering to this 90% audience. Yeah. And they're making the beginner user interface friendly experience in such a way that anybody can pick up Diablo 4 and start enjoying it. And I believe I, that to be I true. Wholeheartedly agree. Yeah, I wholeheartedly yeah. agree. I can put the I can put the controllers in front of a nine year old yeah. and they can reach level one hundred on Diablo 4. hundred percent. My issue is and this is this is true for my my old burner, Destiny Destiny. Um there is a turning point when a game becomes for its general user and for its fan. A hundred percent. I think there have to be different styles of games. But here's the problem that like us three and many other gamers mm -hmm. in this space will have to kind of come to terms with is mm -hmm. that back in the 90s, in the early 2000s, we were the only people playing these games. Correct. We were the primary audience. Nowadays, with the, the induction of mobile gaming and a general gaming populace, we are the minority. And I don't okay. think AAA game studios, Blizzard included, Epic included, all of these AAA studios... They are never going to make a game for mm -hmm. us again. And I think we have to come to terms. Money oh. is not going to make games for I, I agree the with you. niche okay. audience that is us who grew up on gaming. I agree with you, Eric, but also understand that the, re the fact that they're ip the reason why that story hits the way it hits is because the people who were there before knew they had a fan base into what they were doing and developed it so what happens when you remove that element and go for 90 percent and the interest these are these are the these are not the these are not the diehards who will stay on your IP regardless of whatever happens. These are the people who are fair weather. It's a fa it's a popular game now, and it's fun to play for a time. And then immediately after, they will put this game down, and they will not continue to grind your nightmare dungeons. I... They will not sh shoot for your uh, uber uniques. They are here just for a good time, and as soon as that good time is done, they are gone. And I, I don't think... I think that a lot of these games are making such a majority of their money in this first pass of general populace mm -hmm. that there, it's always going to be one of release something that's close enough that has some enjoyment factor that right. like gets this general populace to play, enjoy the game. The majority, they buy the game. Now... Let's focus on low effort changes that keep some amount of people recurring and playing the game. I think that gets them enough money that they're like they're not really worried about much else. Everything else is going to be PR. True. And for and it's this is really only amounts to the the biggest of triple A game studios and there are exceptions like as we'll probably talk about larian is a huge exception in this regard <laughs> like we'll get to that <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that but i think that these big companies like larian i would almost i i think they're big enough that maybe they class start to creep into triple a but i when i i think 
AAA in general. We're talking about like the monoliths in the, absolutely the the gaming we're not industry. Ta- we're not talking about uh, uh, Team Cherry, or yeah. we're not talking we're not talking about Super Super Giant, Giant or anybody or like that. anything like that. We're, no. we're really talking about the Blizzards, and yes. it, it, you know, I just don't think those companies are going to make a game that caters to the niche gaming community yeah. that is that happens to include us three. Yeah. I love Diablo 4. I love the story. I love the choices that you make during the campaign. The campaign, and here's yeah. my take on it. What do you the mean campaign, choices, Anthony? Sorry, Eric. <laughs> what do you mean by choices, Eric? It is a linear story. It is a it is a, it is a <laughs> agree. No, it is a linear I'm story. I'm, I'm not talking about choices yeah. that like you're making that change the game. I'm just saying your character does things in that game mm-hmm. and they're like cool philosophical interesting bits in this story. Right. Okay. Right. Like when you stab this guy missing half of his body in a tree with a spear and his dog uh-huh. sits there and watches. Oh yeah, like, that was rough. <laughs> you have to click on the guy. Like I'm not saying that's a choice in the sense that like you could do something else. But man, that's like uh, that's that whole storyline is pretty metal. It's pretty metal. Yeah. The, the actual story in that game, the campaign, is the coolest part of that game. I think True. if Fair. I were to develop that game, I would make it so, just like Path of Exile, essentially, where the campaign gets you the things to set you up for in game yeah. or as close as possible. Like, yeah. all of the extra difficulty, all of the extra. BS that all of the extra grinding it's like I want to do the campaign and the campaign to be a journey that takes me to end game and then I want to experience in game I would argue their end game isn't entirely fleshed, fleshed out, out yet at all yeah no. but nightmare so nightmare dungeons as a end game they already saw what happened with Diablo 3 with that like yeah. To me, it feels like you are beating an old horse, and I don't know if Anthony can speak to this at all. I don't know if he played Diablo 3 really near the end of it, but like, I played like the very last season of Diablo 3, and the amount of numbers and everything that were popping up, I was I felt nothing. And I understand where they are going with this season, because like, sorry, with this game. Because I I get it. They're trying to learn from what they did with Diablo 3 and how, like, the numbers just got insane and the builds really just came, became stale. People weren't really interested in staying for the seasonal content. Totally understand that. Why are we doing it again, though? Well, no. Well, one of the worst things that they did in Diablo 3 was having those chains and, and having to keep the chain and you're just, like, blowing through and you've killed... 200 enemies, 300 enemies, 400 enemies. You got to keep going. You got to build up that chain to get that multiplier. And they took it out in Diablo 4, and that's great. Oh, it's great. But I mean, like, is it as satisfying? I think there is... I think Diablo 4 is more satisfying because there's challenge. I I think there's something to be said for that. Like, there, I don't know if their execution was exactly where I would want it to be. Essentially, they had a problem where, hey, let's just flood dopamine kickoff with one button spammers. That's True. really cool sometimes, mm-hmm. especially when it first pops off. And their solution was to add uh, what I would call filler abilities. These filler mm-hmm. abilities generate resources that cause a pop-off and a dopamine rush. It causes all of the good feelings. You get, you, you do some abilities and bam, you get all of the rush. And then cool things happen. And my only concern is that everybody has a different amount of that generative ability, filler ability threshold or how much of that they want in their life. Fair. Right. And so they chose a solution to that problem that inherently 
is going to have conflicting ideals on that. Like different, different every separate yeah. player will have a different feeling of whether that feels good or doesn't feel good based on the timing. For some people, it might be the perfect amount. They may love it exactly how it is. Like, that's fine. A lot of players won't know any better. They'll also love it because they'll be like, oh, yeah, any second now. Oh, yeah, the, okay, boom. Here it comes. Right? Like, Here it, it comes. Right? You know, <laughs> a, a lot of people, that's going to be totally enough. Uh, and then for some people, it's not going to be enough because they're going to be like, man, I'm spending 80% of my time just doing killer abilities that don't do anything just to build up enough to be able to pop off and do my cool abilities. Why can't I just do more of my cool abilities through X, Y, and Z, right? And mm. you're, gonna want it, you're gonna want less of those filler abilities. And I don't know if I have a good solution for that in that like, it would take a significant amount of time to design something better that also solves the goal of not making it spammy like it Eric, was in they, Diablo 3. They've had a while. Agreed. Agreed. This is something had they had. While. In my opinion, they needed a different solution. Uh, not because the current solution is bad for everybody. Like, like Anthony you know, says, I think the more challenging aspect of that is good. However, I understand that a lot of people don't enjoy that aspect of it. And that's like one of their primary concerns. Of the game. You know, what, what's really interesting is like, for me, one of the coolest parts is the world boss battles because of how epic those are and you're trying to dance around the boss and avoid certain things and mechanics mm -hmm. and that even happens on the small scale with the smaller things but what it makes me want and wish that they did was if they could have just gotten a little bit closer to some monster hunter style mechanics mm, yeah it could have been something completely incredible where it's like to give us a little bit more control and granularity over increase the increase the combat. expectation that people have to pay attention to the fight like don't make a complete like a massive yeah. meat bag with just areas that you have to avoid for damage i totally agree with yep. that that's that's a, actually a fantastic idea let me manipulate I, the freaking boss by breaking his freaking tail off. Well, and stuff. It also, you know, it, also like, it also implies the fact that you have to communicate with the people who are in the raid. Like honestly, I feel like a world boss should be a very. I, I feel like people would disagree with this because of, of the fact that world bosses provide such loot for the weekly experience, and you just want to get yeah. through it at this point in time. Diablo right doesn't now have, doesn't have a lot of things that keep you like yeah. wanting to spend a long bout of time in the game you just want to get your tasks done to get from point a to point b as quickly as possible and i i would say like a lot of people so one of my favorite uh games was were the genre of arpg arena battlers so i love things mm -hmm. like bloodline champions i love oh. battle right i love battle right was um, so good and I used to do, I, I played so much of these things. I, I, I have way too many hours uh, culminated <laughs> in Arena Battlers. And so like V Rising and stuff like that is such a cool, so, so Stunlock Studios is kind of the game that really headlines this genre of games. Mm -hmm. And I like V Rising. I, I like what it's doing. I am I, very much for that game. However, I am waiting for a true ARPG co-op experience that has this like story element to it mm -hmm. that like Diablo does, but has the impact in combat of something like V Rising Bloodline Champions, where every ability matters. You don't see that in Path of Exile? I feel like you see it some in Path of Exile. But I still get the feeling of a switch over. For example, when I get the Path of Exile and I start to uh, um, really start grinding towards the end of the campaign, I'm using one ability, right? Yeah. I'm using that one ability. I, I, I really like all of the stuff that I'm seeing for Path of Exile 2 that I feel Ooh, is going good. to add more to it that. I'm good. so excited. It looks I, good. 
And I think that's closer to where I'd like it to be. But I still think there are some weaknesses in Path of Exile that I, I think are just... It doesn't quite have the depth of combat of something like V Rising. And I'm waiting for something to beautifully mesh those two ideas. Where you're building yeah. a character, you have this RPG, you have these abilities or some ability building mechanic. And you're doing some bombastic shit. But you have like a, a series of five-ish abilities mm -hmm. and each one feels dope when you pull it off. Because I feel like that's mm. what ARPG arenas, every single ability, when you land it, when it happens, feels great. Absolutely. And in something like Diablo 4 or even Path of Exile, you have one ability. It feels that great. Weight. Yeah. And then the rest of the abilities are what I would consider filler abilities. You're just yeah. doing them. In these yeah. arenas, you have an auto attack that it, like you're just trying to hit every now and then. But every time you cast an ability, you land it, cool shit happens. And that feels amazing. And I think there's a beautiful mesh somewhere in there, like mixing those up. And I mm. haven't seen a game do it perfect yet. So, For some reason, you just made me think that it would almost be fun if the characters in Diablo felt like Dota or League of Legends players with their abilities. A hundred percent. That's, that's yeah. like what I'm looking for, right? Like, I want something mm. with that mechanical depth, but in a co-op story world experience like a dungeon experience and yeah that would be so yeah. cool that would be dope and there are games that have tried to do this i just feel like there hasn't been they've always one fallen short that, yeah they've always had some mishap or miss you know they just quite haven't quite gotten there and i mm -hmm. i i'm excited for when that happens and i think it will happen because i mean what if, like, you had the, the idea, like I was saying, make it more Monster Hunter-like. And by being Monster Hunter-like, it's like you've got this weapon, and this weapon gives you these abilities. And these abilities are like League of Legends, Dota-style abilities. So and then I, you can yeah, master that weapon. A... And you... I, I don't yeah. mind that. The only thing I'm worried about is I... I feel like for things like Guild Wars 2, Monster Hunter, and things where you have an ability set per weapon, I don't mm -hmm. mind that as a game, but I think it misses the mark for me when I consider a game like Diablo 4, where half of the experience and fun of Path of Exile and Diablo 4 is this idea of building out a set of abilities and then having it come together nicely. And that is satisfying. Mm, and so true. if you give me a weapon and that gives me a set of abilities and that's fun, I'm like, I'm going to play that game. That sounds cool. But I right. think it is a different game than what my dream game Idealist. in the genre would be. Now, it could be that those weapons have like sockets in it and maybe those sockets determine a set of abilities and those abilities are different based on the weapon you have. Like, I definitely think there's something there. I just think it needs to have that bit of custom ability so that you connect the dots. I feel like that connect the dots feeling Ooh. is the nice part that I'm looking for mm. in addition to the nice combat. Synergy. Yeah. I mean, at the same time, maybe they could just have made the abilities more impactful and better and keep it how it is in the sense where you do pick what abilities you want. And there are ones that obviously synergize but you could make a really weird combo. Yeah. Until Diablo 4 starts hitting those kinds of notes, which I, I, I would hope that they would, but honestly, I've already given up on achieving the end of the season. I don't, I, I really I don't, I don't care. I would say yeah. my opinion on it right now is that I am waiting for the next expansion. Um, to really kick off and kind of change things up. I, I don't see myself playing a lot of the seasons unless they totally revamp things. Right. Uh, I love the campaign. I think the campaign's great. Again, I think the core gameplay loop is really, really fun. 
I think the game's fun. I think it's worthwhile for anybody who hasn't played it to go and play it. It's, it's just, a really the game good game. It's just not finished. But it, it it's missing the part of it that would keep me playing. Right now, right. it's a 25-hour experience mm-hmm. for... Uh, you know, seventy bucks, and or yeah. that's a lot of money, Eric. Uh, agree. That is a agree. lot of if money we're for looking, twenty-four hours. If we are looking hours. at cost-benefit analysis, a little cheaper than going to the movies. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, that's fair. <laughs> that's rough. That's fair. Yeah, Oof. fair. Yeah, Oof. even cheaper than renting a movie at home. Oh my god. So, okay, uh, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Okay, so uh, Diablo Four. I kind of uh, dropped that off, and now I am between two games at the moment. One of them we already know about, but the other one is an oldie but a goodie. Um, I'm playing Hollow Knight again. Oh, yeah, we know why you're playing that one. And yeah, man, yeah. I, Hollow good. Knight is a beautiful game. It's a it's such a fantastically designed game. A beautiful game. Team like, Cherry did amazing. I am so excited. For, for Silk Song, uh, yeah, Silk Song. I I am just absolutely over the. Moon the about. only issue I have right now is I am so rusty that I'm having to relearn the game pretty much. Oh, so that's that's I even am, better. What are we no, talking it's about? Not. No, no, it's not. I don't. I don't think you've heard beauty. me scream in frustration because I know that I was physically capable of oh, this man. like five years ago. But yeah. mm-mm, not it is not a pleasant scream. My wife thinks it's hilarious, though. Oh my god! <laughs> just just wait until you get to the the White Palace again, and everything Stop. will feel great. Stop! Why yeah. would you say that? Why did? You, why would you? No. Anyway, um, so I'm it? playing Hollow Knight right now, and if for anybody who's listening right now who has not played anything akin to Hollow Knight or Ori in the Blind Forest, or any any game that's Metroidvania S that has come out in the last like fifteen years that Man. has tried to, to has tried to reapproach the medium with a little bit of a uh, different form of artistry. Please give these games a shot. Like, oh man, it um, is wonderful. What is it? Moon Studio is Ori in the Blind Forest, yep. and then Team Cherry is Hollow Knight. Both of the games are in, are great. Hollow Knight is for those who want like a darker kind of like Dark Souls kind of vibe game, but also like a cutesy kind of vibe as well. Like, oh my god, I I can't sing the praises enough for the game because honestly, my wife was like, "No, I love this game," and I was like, "I know, I love it too," and I want to watch you play it. And then it just slowly devolved into me playing the game. Yeah. Like it will it will suck you in, and you'll be like, "Why is this game so hard?" And then you'll get to the a- end of the uh, game and be like, "Why is this game so hard?" Yeah, I. <laughs> but you're still playing. <laughs> and I would I would really recommend for anybody out there like don't. Don't look up guides for Hollow Knight. Like, don't no, experience just play that game. It, man. Explore the just world. Play enjoy it. the world. It has a percentage meter in the in the pause screen. You can see how much of the game you've completed. Yep. And yep. go through and play through the game, and then look at that meter, and then play it again and look some more. It is such a wonderful experience, and some of the most satisfying. Uh, environmental storytelling of oh, God, any game yes. that has come out. I, I heavily recommend it. Hollow Knight is sound- one of my favorites. Yeah, I'm a soundtrack like simp. Oh, it's great. That that game slaps. It does. Period. It's a, like it's, a, it's got a lot of bangers. Like I can't see anybody like coming up to me and saying that Hollow Knight does not have a better soundtrack than any of the fronts from software games i would put it up against some of the final fantasy soundtracks in my opinion i i would too but man there are some of the final i would fantasy put it up against <laughs> i did not say it would win <laughs> yeah, yeah that's a rough one right there i mean that's a hard that's a hard sell i know, I know. Nobuo Uematsu is, he's uh, incredible but um yeah i'm playing hollow knight and it is fantastic i'm in where am i i just got the uh dream blade and now uh it's it's in that weird limbo state of the game where like you're not exactly sure what you're supposed to do with this now 
Um, so you mean the start of the game and the yeah, end of the game much, and all much. of all of the game? All of the game. Yes, absolutely. But uh, yeah, we're getting there. You know, it's a, it's a great game, and honestly, it's it's one of those games where you you're not sure why it is that you want to master it, but you do. So fantastic game. Um, and then finally, uh, w- we can talk about my last one uh, after you go over yours, Eric, because that's those are my last. But uh, for the game that I want to that I have my eye on, um, it is called what is it called? It's uh, Moonbreaker. Moonbreaker, if you have not looked it up, is oh man, how do I explain it? It is a top-down figure-based, like almost uh, very board game esque. Very board game, uh, uh, very board game turn-based strategy game with a high level of customization, customization of the figures themselves, and as well as the gameplay. Like, there have been some crazy things that I've seen that I'm like, oh, this may actually be, like, kind of interesting. Also, stories written by Brandon Sanderson. I know. You are welcome. I know. (laughs) I I have had my eye on this as well. It gives me very much Warhammer uh, 40K vibes, but quirkier and more almost cartoonish, but, like, in a good way. Very right, like very um, jovial and and it, it almost feels like a um, uh, a blood bowl type of deal, but it, it, it also, looks very yeah. Cool. There's also a game that just came out called Stray Gods. It is uh, a role playing musical, and I may, I may be a simp for a lot of the cast, to be honest. But uh, it looks really good. It has kind of some notes of what I would consider attractive for me in terms of somebody who loved Hades. Yeah. So I'm hoping this is some, this is the debut of a developer. Uh, I don't know much about Summerfall Studios, to be honest. But well, I this think is the this first is one. their first uh, big release, right? Oh, okay. I don't think I've seen anything else by them. Uh, let me check their Steam. It looks like they don't have anything else on Steam besides the oh. stray, stray Gods. So, well, this is very reminiscent of what I felt whenever I first touched a Super Giant game. So, I'm hoping that this is kind of like the bridge between a Super Giant game and uh, God, who who just made the uh, the Expanse. Uh, oh my God, what they're what are they called? They did The Walking Dead. Um, they did oh. fairy tale. Um, Telltale. Yes, thank you. Yeah. It's like a cross between Supergiant and Telltale. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll see. Um, yeah, but those are my like kind of looking at looking's out. Uh, how about yourself there, and uh, Eric? Yeah. So my, uh, I guess I'll, I'll go over. I, I don't have that many. Um, so, <laughs> so playing, man? weekly, I of course do uh, a lot of Gloomhaven, um, which I just to kind of put it out there, the video game version of Gloomhaven is just so nice to play. Um, is it though? It, it it is very much so. I Gloomhaven is a phenomenal board game that has been digitized. And they pretty much nailed the rule set. They make it so much easier to get up and going and have a group that plays it weekly. Uh, okay. But that that's kind of anybody who, know, who knows the board game kind of knows what they're getting. What's going on there? Yeah. Got you. So that's there's nothing new there. Um, so before we get to the the big release of the week, the other one that I have just recently gotten back into um, is Caves of Cud. Caves of Cud. Which if the fuck is Caves of Cud? If nobody has ever played, it is probably one of the most expansive adventure RPGs that I've ever played. Uh, It is so good, so phenomenal. Uh, Very a small development team, Uh, but the the reason I I started playing it again is because. 
What was that? I've been making it for 15 years. Yes. Holy shit. It is. It has a That's lot of depth behind it. So, 2008? Yeah. So, when I tell you this game is expansive, you can pretty much do anything. It is crazy complicated. This looks insane. Eric. Oh, it's insane, Nat. It is crazy. But it's oh. so cool. It is such a wonderful experience. And just recently, the reason I got back into it and it kind of came back onto my radar is that the developers of Dwarf Fortress are now actually working uh, with the developers of Caves of Cud to of get this released next year. So it's been in early access and in Forever. development for eight years. Jesus. Dude. And now Dwarf Fortress, the Dwarf Fortress team is going to help them release it next year overwhelm like there are a few games that like you can really kind of see a community rally around that has nine thousand well 657 reviews leading them towards overwhelmingly positive and, and that i i can't give it enough praise that's insane um it is an rpg like no other it is an experience like no other it has some of the coolest and most in-depth rpg mechanics that exist i mean when you have a team that is working with low uh you know low quality art like this like the art assets don't take a lot of time i mean they yeah, take time but true. not as much time as like 3d or anything crazy there is a lot of work put into the div like the development of mechanics and systems and interactions yeah and you have everything like one of the coolest mechanics that I'll, I'll go over a little bit. So you can play a, one of two races. You can either play a Trukin or you can play a mute, mutated human. So the Trukin allow you to become a cyborg, right? You can okay. replace parts of your body with uh, cybernetic parts, et cetera, et cetera. If you play a mutated human, you can either mutate yourself physically or mentally. If you mutate yourself physically, you can like get extra arms, whip extra weapons, whip extra guns. You could have 20 arms and 20 weapons, <laughs> right? You could have five heads, right? Absurd. It, it's, it's pretty absurd how much you can mutate yourself physically. But if you mutate yourself mentally, you essentially become a multidimensional being. Oh, God. And you get all of these psychic powers. But as you get more and more psychic powers, there is a religious sect in the game that will send stronger and stronger foes to hunt you down for being a multidimensional being, essentially. What? Because you're, uh, what, blaspheming against their god? Exactly. And so oh, they send God. psychic hunters after you. And it is so crazy, so off the wall, so many interactions. There's different political factions. There, like You can become friends with goblins or uh, uh, like deers. <laughs> like, everything has a faction. It is just a cool, in-depth experience. Uh, I... I recommend it to anybody who can kind of deal with a turn-based RPG of this. With low-poly graphics, got it. I think low-poly is overselling the graphics a little. It is ASCII art for anybody uh, interested, um, okay. just to put it out okay. there. <laughs> okay. But well, color is ASCII art. <laughs> what are you, what are your what are your eyes on Eric? What are you looking at? And you're like, hmm, I want some of that. Uh, so I am. Uh, so the Brandon Sanderson was one of simp. them. Uh, simp. I am a hundred percent a Brandon Sanderson simp. I uh, just all across the wall. But actually, the one I am really excited to get my hands on that I hope is as good as all of the trailers uh, show it to be 
is Starfield. I am super excited Ooh. to play Starfield. I so far oh. I love everything that's coming out with it. I think that Bethesda has fallen short with a lot of their most recent games. Fair. And I think they also fall under this triple A stigma in a lot of cases. But Starfield looks to be kind of pulling on those old heartstrings of the older Bethesda titles, which I fell so? in love with as a kid. Okay. Some of the trailers and some of the systems and some of the dialogue that I have seen kind of give me that old school, you know, Morrowind vibe. You know, I'm not that Fallout lie. New Vegas vibe. I am yeah. not holding my hopes too high. Um, but it is one Bethesda was kind of like my first love in gaming. And I really would love another game to kind of be like that. And Starfield more, has some inklings. More, please. So I am, ex more. I am tentatively excited to see how it goes. Okay. I want to say, game. huh? I want Starfield to come out and be like so good that you just play it for a couple years, maybe five years until, uh, you know, Star Citizen actually comes out. And oh my God. <laughs> multiplayer <laughs> version. By that time, we'll all be living in pods, my dude. <laughs> Yeah, we'll be in the yeah. Star Citizen. We'll be simulated yeah. into the actual game itself. At that point, oh yeah. my god! Yeah, that's what okay. I'm kind of excited for. So I guess the the only other elephant in the room is uh, I think, especially me and Matt, and I know to a lesser degree, Anthony. Uh, Can we get to that? We, we have been. Do you have something else before? No, I'm 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 more so uh, thinking like where is Anthony kind of sitting on the fence with Baldur's Gate? Because honestly, I'm not sitting on the fence. Okay, here's okay. what has happened anyway, for me. So we're with... the, the elephant in the room is Baldur's Gate. By the way, it's a fantastic game. Oh yeah, it's, 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 it's incredibly right. deep. Dalarian is insane for dropping this game in like the swath of AAA games that like, yeah. currently dominate the, the yeah. gaming. Uh, for foyer i I, think, I cannot think of a better game right now I, I it is definitely one of the most polished experiences that you can have on the market right now yeah. and like even people who don't like crpgs are loving this game yeah uh, yeah there is something to be said about somebody taking a D and D fifth edition rule set putting it into game form and saying yeah you'll like this <laughs> and everybody likes it. And like, everybody likes it. I do like the game. Okay. Yep. So let's, I, so okay, let's, let's. I can very quickly tell you what's up with the game for me. So there's only one gripe, um, and I think a lot of people have it. But what has happened with the game for me is I play with a wonderful set of people that mm. have played so much of this game in early exactly. access. And I started yeah, playing it in early access with them. And li yeah, literally. They know everything like the back of their hand. And so I go into this game, and I, it, I don't get to discover anything. I, I don't even get spoilers, really, because things are happening so fast that mm -hmm. I just have no idea what's happening. So for me, it's like, oh, we're in combat? Combat's amazing. This is so cool. Outside of combat, it's like, I don't know what's going on. Oh, and I don't know what's going on because guess what? Someone's talking to somebody, and I don't know they're talking they to somebody. They are five steps ahead of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. and I don't get to. And, and when I go to finally listen in, I miss the beginning of the conversation. Yeah, yeah. So you really what have are we to doing experience here? this game with like either you have to experience it with people who are doing it for the first time. <laughs> or you have to experience it on your own at your own pace to truly mm -hmm. get, understand the depth. Understand the depth, but not even understand the depth, but to like the fun. feel the world experience because the world mm. experience really it just draws you in, and it doesn't let you go uh, uh, ever at all. No. And 
this world is so complex. I mean, Farron and uh, the Forgotten Realms are so... They have a breadth of history over, like, what is it? Like, 400 novels? You know? Dude, pro probably, probably around like, 400. Like, multiple the, the dozens of, of games that have, that have tapped into it, the amount of games, right? the heroes that have made themselves known in other games now as well like and then not to mention the fact that a lot of D, &D has become so synonymous yeah. with a nerd culture like yeah. you can't you can't talk to somebody who plays video games and doesn't know about D, &D in some of the settings like i could probably say icewind dale to somebody who's in a chat for cod now and they yeah. probably know what the hell i'm talking about yeah. right and it's, Whereas if it's I was crazy. in middle school, they would have no idea what I was talking about if I said Crench and Shinobon. They'd be like, what? Yeah. Nobody, knew, nobody knew what it was. When, nobody when, knows when, what the fuck when, I'm talking you, about. When I read that as uh, the, you know, a fifth grader, nobody knew what that was. Nobody was reading no. Ari Salvatore in, no. <laughs> in middle school. Like, he was, it was unheard of. The Forgotten Realms wasn't even... It, it didn't even have a core committee to make sure the history was good when we started yeah. doing it. True, true. Hey. So, Anthony, I understand where you're coming from. I, myself, have not even played this game solo yet. I've only played in the group that you're in and the group yeah. with, uh, with uh, Tony as well. Like, so mm -hmm. I totally get it. There are pieces of the game that I'm just like, I have no idea what's going on. But, and this, is, this might be just me, like, the, com the actions that you make and as well as the combat and decisions that lay like pretty much just lay out the, the game for you are strong enough for me that i'm like okay i get it i don't know as much as everybody else in like this portion of the game but this is only like if i could show you the timeline of what this game actually encompasses mm -hmm. what crazy. they know what they know <laughs> is such a small portion of what's actually going to be happening with this story it's so mm -hmm. small. I mean, like I, 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 I remember, and like spoiler note for anybody on the Forgotten <laughs> Realms train, but uh, like I, I need to read some of the books. Like, you can be a cleric of Lolf and have hours. Is Lolf like still living? Is that like a thing? Lulf? So they didn't exactly elaborate where this was time wise. So I will say another thing. Spoiler alert. Um, Sass Tam is no longer the over the the uh ruler of Fey. I didn't know that. Yeah. Like there's there's I, a lot know, of is stuff. that a is that a common yeah. thing? Like yeah. am I am I out of the loop, Eric? Uh, I, I'm uh, asking look. you as a as like a nerd. Am I out of the loop? Is Sass Tam supposed to be like okay, for those of you guys who are listening and don't know what the fuck we're talking about, about <laughs> Sass Tam is a is a powerful lich who rules over an entire region yeah. of Faerun. And yeah. he is a bad man and he has red wizards of Fey who go about and try and do his will, right? Yeah. Um I was in an event in the game and I I made a decision based on what of my knowledge of that character. And immediately got punished for it. Yeah, I, I like, it's the same type of thing. I, yeah, I am not caught up, caught up enough on uh, Forgotten Realms. Or, I mean, it's so expansive. It's I don't... crazy expansive. So I say, sorry, I say that Anthony to to explain to you, like even people who have played this game before or who have previous knowledge of this of this system are getting fucked over because they, they are relying on, on false information. I don't know when this game is set. I don't know what is happening anymore, but it's fun. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying really myself. Well it is very fun. The combat is... Yeah, I mean, it's Dungeons & Dragons combat. It's absolutely yeah. wonderful. The only criticism that I would have kind of stems from Anthony's experience yeah is that i really want them and i know this is something they're going to do because there's been so much feedback on it but and larian's just really good about oh yeah taking feedback oh, and then putting yeah. it into the game but i really want them to have an auto join uh option for dialogue mm -hmm. i really mm -hmm. want to see because that's our biggest problem so me and my mm -hmm. wife are playing through it and 
disgusting. The, the biggest... How dare you not invite us? <laughs> Y'all are invited. Y'all are more than welcome. Lies. But how... one of the Go biggest. Ahead, one of the say what biggest... you want to say, Anthony. Well, say what you want to say, no, Anthony. Anthony... How would we know you're playing? How would we know? <laughs> You Anthony. say you're invited. <laughs> so when, Eric? When? when oh, and whenever we get time, essentially. Um, oh my god! But but one of the biggest biggest things is, I'll start talking to somebody, and I look over and she's like, not in the dialogue, and I'm like, oh shit, this is important dialogue. <laughs> she probably wants to be a part yeah. of this, but yep. she doesn't see the 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 indicator saying that I'm in dialogue. Right, like it tells you in the chat box, and it it shows a little thing over their profile picture. But um, it's so muted and yeah, not yeah, yeah, very yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. obvious. Yeah, I but, want you know I want some <laughs> option to either auto join or give you a pop up dialogue that says, "Hey, your a party member is in dialogue. Do you want to join them? Yes or no?" Yeah. Right. You know what I on you the, know what I love about this. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Anthony. I I, I want to on the same yeah. vein. Really need a follow this player option. Like, oh, come on, yeah. Like, if you could go ahead and just like turn it off. Okay, you right there click is. follow. There is, but like, it's a. It's is a, there seriously? It's an involved process. Like, you basically give up control of your character for like just a portion of time, and hand it off. Oh. I don't think you could ever go to the true observer mode though. Though, so like, actually, I don't think you can do that. Like, you have to be in control of your character at all times. You have to be oh. in control of something. Because then people yeah. would just like freeload and just like watch you play the game, and well, like I mean, that's weird. That? That's what who would want to do that's that? What you do in, that's what you do in D and D all the time. It's like, yeah, I'm gonna go with the group. Absolutely. We're gonna stick together. That's why. Oh, we're sticking together. We're having the no, same conversation the all the time. with this all the with time. this character. Yeah. So we're all involved in the conversation, yeah. not so, just one person. Anthony, I think this this game, this ex entire experience needs to be lived through you in a land style kind of like gameplay like if mm -hmm. and i wouldn't even say like this has to be like us three but i think if you played this game on the same network as somebody else in another room and like you were close enough to scream at them or basically just like to be able to like kind of like pick up on what they're already doing yeah like it, i don't know it makes I, it better for me, for me yeah it but... just makes it better it makes it better for like the problem that you're experiencing, but yeah, I still mm -hmm. don't think that is a good argument not to try and put additional helper oh, solutions. No, for no the absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are some, there are some there are some definite solutions. There's some that quality they should be of life into. stuff, you know, just like yeah. Let me auto join discussion. Yeah, you know? yeah, it would be great. Cause, but cause... I will also say, playing this game solo is something that I would definitely suggest. A question oh, 100%. for you, Anthony. I have a solo playthrough and a co-op playthrough, and they have yeah. gone wildly different. <laughs> uh, wildly what style different. Of, what style of character are you playing? So let's so, go with so like general spec. Yeah. I have created... <clears throat> I have created... One of my is, is Thor, the god of thunder. Okay. Tempest uh, cleric. A Tempest cleric who... Okay. Uh, is a badass and okay. he intimidates at every option <clears throat> and he has beaten oh. up multiple people for not listening. Oh. Um and it's absolutely wonderful. And that <laughs> one I have I have like 35 hours into that campaign. What level? Um I am level I want to say I'm five. level 7. Wow. Wow. He's much farther now. than I am. Jesus. Um and then I am playing the stereotypical horny drow bard uh, with my wife. <laughs> and let me let me tell you the absolute funniest thing. So, oh God. my wife is playing a human cleric or a half elf cleric, I think. And I'm a Seldarine drow. And as a Seldarine Drow, I have left the Drow society and abandoned mm -hmm. Lolf mm -hmm. as my goddess. And I live on the surface, and I'm peace and lovely, and I am just a typical Tristern. bard. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but uh, I'm a bard who doesn't really care. Like, okay, let's be real. 
<laughs> like I don't I don't give a shit about your problems. Like I play music and like fiddle around. Let's be real. <laughs> but uh my wife is a half elf. I just some cleric of Lulf. Oh shit. <laughs> and so I have forsaken Awkward. Lolf. <laughs> Awkward. So our, our character dynamics, and she had uh, she didn't know who Lolf was, you know? She Obviously. Just, she just picked one of the options that sounded cool, which just happened to be the absolute Opposite. best option to pick to make an interesting character duo. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, oh, my God. That's so Anthony. funny. Anthony, where are you with your spec right now? I know, I know which what one of them is. Are you in another co-op at all, or is it the same one? No, I'm very much looking forward to playing both solo and with my wife to get like the proper experience of the game. But also, I think that Eric talking about the bard. I feel like if I ever play a bard, every time I go into combat, I'm just gonna start playing toss a coin for your Witcher on repeat. Until <laughs> that the combat funny. is over. That's funny. <laughs> Stupid. I, you, you know, How that's one of the best you. things, too, is you can start playing music. And I, I'll, I'll tell you one of the most interesting encounters I've had so far in the, in the game. And it was kind of just by luck. It didn't happen intentionally. Uh, so you meet a group of people very early in the game. And I, I won't give any spoilers for anybody playing, but there's a group of people... And they, they won't let you pass. And I'm like, I walk up to them and I start talking to them. And they're like, we're not letting a drow in here. I'm like, well, fuck these guys. While I'm in this dialogue, uh, the half-elf cleric that I'm with uh, is just, yeah, my wife is just clicking around, looking around at things. And... As this dialogue pops up that is talking about, we won't let a drow in here, she happens to pass through the invisible wall that we cannot pass without them going aggro. Oh so they God. immediately go aggro. And the entire camp <laughs> is trying to kill us. I am convinced it's because I'm a drow. And so we die. And I'm like, I don't know what we're supposed to do. We like, can't get, we, can't I, get in. We, we can't get into the place. The main story goes there. My other campaign, I have no clue. I don't know what to do like do we just become evil like are we evil now like kind of I mean, turns out drow it had slime. nothing to do with me being a drow and it took us a second to figure that out but it absolutely just a hilarious experience that happened and both playthroughs have been equally enjoyable and equally played out differently because the choices are all just different and it is so different that like I wouldn't even consider the first playthrough the same game so far in a lot of sense as the second. Fair. Game. And it's it's really cool to see that. Essentially, every time you play a new class or character, the game feels sufficiently different. And that's anecdotal to my experience of just two different characters, but mm -hmm. it was sufficiently different that I have some level of confidence that there is enough... Mm -hmm differentiation between each playthrough that I'll be able to create a few more characters and have a sufficiently different experience for all of those characters. Have you felt tempted to choose any of the pre-made characters? No, except for one. I am definitely going to do a Dark Urge playthrough. And the so Dark Urge looks dope. If anybody doesn't know, there are three different character options. And I say three, the game tells you there's two, but there's really three. There is a custom character option where you kind of get to build out your own guy and everything's hunky-dory. You can mm -hmm. play them however you want. Then there are the pre-made characters, and these include characters like Astarian and Shadowheart. They're pre-made. They have a story. They have a thing that they've done in the world, and you get to live through their experience as they're dealing with said thing throughout this story. Correct. Really cool. I've seen some bits and pieces of that in both my playthroughs yeah. sufficiently cool story characters i think and then there's the dark urge the dark urge you can customize the difference with the dark urge as i understand it is that you have dark urges and they happen <laughs> i did not know that <laughs> as far as i understand it, and i haven't played it yet so uh, of course somebody from the audience might might correct me later down the road 
I've only yeah, heard inklings cool. about it. But from what I understand, you can play that character however you want, but some of the dialogue choices are your dark urge happens, from what I understand. Or like Damn. bad option happens. You could be as good as you want and then bad shit. Like, I don't know that's how great. that's going to work, but I know I'm playing that character at some point because that sounds so dope. That's right? very reminiscent of, uh, I don't know if you've read this book, uh, probably. Uh, Joe Amber Crombie's The Blade itself has, uh, well, sorry, no. Um, I forget what the series is called, but um, the first book is The Blade itself. And there's one character who's going around and like he has the rep this reputation of being... Um, like he has two names. He, one of them is like something two fing uh four fingers, and the other one is like I believe it's like the hound or or something. And every single interaction you have with this guy, he's just doing the best that he can. Yeah. Like he's literally just trying to make it work, right? And it gets to the end of the first book. And sorry, spoilers, but like honestly, just read the book. It's fat fantastic. You find out why he's called the hound. And it's oh, it, it's man. it's a it's a complete flip. Oh wow! And it's it's the way that they do it. It's very reminiscent of like no, there's a reason why some people have two names. Yeah. So I like read the book. Send in Glockta is an amazing character just in yeah. itself. Just read that part, like and know that story. But like the dichotomy of the other hero characters of the book fantastic and very reminiscent of this dark urge sounding kind of uh archetype that you have to fill whereas like you make a character and no matter what you do bad things are going to follow you wherever you go oh wow yeah i'm gonna add it to my uh audiobook list here oh it's oh it is narrated beautifully oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. he's really good Even oh sorry not beautifully i would say i would say it's narrated well I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say he's a, a uh, uh, Tim Gerard Reynolds or a uh, uh, who Kate does Redding or Kate Redding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or a or a Travis Baldry. Oh my God, I love him. Oh, oh man, Travis. Yes. <laughs> no, they they uh, man, totally off Focus. topic. They, Focus. They, yeah. <laughs> Focus. They, yeah. They took off the HP Lovecraft. Uh, uh, a reader that I absolutely love off of. Oh, uh, and Tim Curry. Oh, I don't know if you. Oh, yeah. fit, focus, focus. Okay. okay. Um, but yeah, Anthony, I know you're on your barbarian kick right now, and you've been mostly doing martial characters. I think you should do a spellcaster class. I oh, think. Yeah. Really, that or, that or a skill monkey. Like, I don't know about you, but like, oh. I've gotten this, I've gotten a huge amount of enjoyment from just being like the person who's like, no, I can get in there. I think <laughs> I, I think as a, as a first time player, sticking to one class is easy, <clears throat> but I would heavily recommend figuring out what your character is and having a theme for them. Picking a class and then multi-classing based on the theme, not based on what's good. I mean, is starting off with one of the default playable characters not a good idea? So, no, there's three. I, I think it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good idea. <laughs> let, me, let me put it this way. The developers of the game stated it as such from what I understand. If you're a new player or you don't know what to choose or the choices are overwhelming, choose one of the story characters. However, mm. the game was designed with the intent of you experiencing their stories as an onlooker and a co-pilot rather than being that character. Mm -hmm. And the experience of this game, as I understand oh. it, was really designed for you to make your character and to experience the world without knowing some of the things that these origin characters know. Yeah. And that uh, makes it interesting. more interesting. Like You're if discovering you, all the time. Exactly. If you play a Shadowheart, you know Shadowheart stuff, or at least you learn so much of it up front that the mystery of Shadowheart doesn't it's not surprising. It doesn't connect. To you. 
Other like, like, even, like spoiler even character. Out. Yeah. yeah. Even in yeah, the playthrough yeah, yeah. that we're in right now, uh, Anthony, we still don't know what Shadow Hearts deal is. And you probably mm -hmm. won't. So one of the great things is you really want to play this game uh, alone at some point, even if you play it with other people. Yeah. Because at yeah, some point... 17... 17,000 endings. Yeah. 17,000 endings. Over really? 17,000 unique Ending. I hate that's, that. That's crazy. <laughs> because that makes me be like, well, what's the best one? <laughs> either either way, the way, the way to really ex like it, think about it is every time you play, so here's the, here's the thing. You have some set of characters, and you're going to have about three characters in your party at any given time. For most of this game, you're going to have the same three characters. So your experience of the game by the way, I just want to put it out there for the audience that isn't uh, able to like see what's happening on our screen. <laughs> Nat is playing Baldur's Gate three now, as <laughs> according to Steam. So. Uh, oh, and what you didn't yeah. see either, Eric, is that I pushed play now right when it popped up on the screen too. Oh so gosh. Nat and I did it at basically the same time. Oh my gosh, y'all are the worst. So. <laughs> oh my god. They have checked out of the podcast. We are... Oh god. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm weak. Uh, I'm weak. It only takes a little bit of stimuli Man. for me to be like, yeah, I want to play that game. I want to play that game. <laughs> but, it's so good. But either way, uh, all that I was kind of getting at is like every time you play with a different set of origin characters and they interact differently, you can experience mm. their stories you experience a certain amount of their stories all at different rates based on who you have in your party all of that changes every time you play it's very unique experience every time and it was wonderfully also, done by larian wonderful if i can add to that like you also get the uh, the opportunity to play as different aspects of whatever you believe should be the uh avatar of your you in those situations so let's say that you <clears> want <throat> to be the oddball in your entire group you can do that like yeah. the idea that you have to play <clears throat> a specific way and it's the only way that you can do it is completely thrown out because each time that you play this game you're going to do different things and it's going to reveal different pathways it's a it is a beautiful uh amalgamation in the sense that yeah amalgamation of just like mechanic and freaking just insane level of replayability in the sense that you will never play i know a lot of people say you can you'll you'll never play the same game, tw game twice this is probably the closest that you're going to get to a game that's going to give you a truly novel experience every single time and you're going to enjoy it. I mean, I'm sure some people have played like Pillars of Eternity and Divinity Original Sin, and they've had this kind of like something close to this. I think this is the first time that you're seeing a true like diluted version of this game like come out. I'll put it out there that for Divinity Original Sin and Divinity Original Sin 2, which I have played through the entire campaign multiple times for both of those games, mm -hmm. the experience was slightly different. And there were new things that I found on each playthrough. Mm -hmm. But it, well, it felt like the same game. I was just getting a little bit more information every time. And it was still fun because tactically the battles were different and I found new stuff. I like, oh, this playthrough I could speak to animals. So I got so many more little excerpts from animals as I went throughout the game. And that was cool and that added a lot of depth. And I am not bashing that experience by any means. Divinity Original Sin and 1 and 2 are wonderful games that should definitely be played. But just in the two semi-playthroughs I've done already of Baldur's Gate 3, each one felt so sufficiently different that I'm like, man, these feel like two different games almost. And I see choices that I could make that would make it a totally different game. Like, I know there are mutually exclusive choices within the first five hours of the game where I'm like, wait a second, if I chose this, the whole game from this point on would have to be different. 
Yep. And like, I know those choices exist. And I'm like, man, at some point I got to do that. Like the game will be different. It will be a different game for the most part. Absolutely. Like that's crazy to me. And that's within the first five hours. And I'm not even like that far in. I'm only like 30 minutes in, 30 hours in. You're not even all the way in, dude. Yeah, it's crazy to me. So it's really cool how they've done it. I, um, I definitely haven't seen a game that is this compelling in a very long time. No. Uh, at this level of quality as well. Like, you know, I talked about Caves of Cud, and there's a level of depth there that is hard to be matched because they've been working on it for so long. And right. while the depth there is insane, there's a level of quality that Larian has for Baldur's Gate 3 that is on a different plane of comparison, right? Absolutely. Which is just, just crazy. So. so effing good. So good. So... Now that we've finished our story time and we are at an hour and 55 minutes for episode one of the unnamed podcast. Not even breaking a sweat. <laughs> I, I think we'll say our adieus and we'll catch you at the next session. Absolutely. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>